Thank you, Pascal. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm just going to get on with it. So uh, I'm the child of an immigrant. My father, there he is, Mike, uh, came to Canada uh, as a, an immigrant from Lebanon. Uh, he's Armenian and was raised in Syria. And uh, he was in the army, in the military, in the Middle East, and that's the skill he brought to Canada. Um, but an immigrant coming to a country like Canada needed to work a lot. My dad had two jobs the whole time I lived uh, in our hometown, and so we would wait at night for him to come home from his second job at about 11 o'clock at night. And after a day of punishing work underneath massive trucks, he'd take off his shirt and uh, lay on the floor of our living room, and me and my sister and brothers would proceed to step on his back to work out all the aches from the day. And I remember viscerally as a seven or eight year old, these gouges in my dad's back. And we, every time we would say, dad, what was that about again? And in the 1930s in the Middle East and around the world, when you got sick as a child, your mother took blades and slit your back to get the blood out. That was called bloodletting. The paradigm at the time was that the bad stuff is in the blood. You gotta get it out so your body can make new blood and get you well again. That was the paradigm. As a kid, you think about your own mother cutting your back when you're the most vulnerable, your sick child, and now as a mother myself of three young children, I just couldn't believe it. And I'll tell you folks, working in healthcare, I have these I can't believe that's how we do it moments all the time. So you might be thinking, oh, that was the 30s. You know, doctors used to smoke during surgery back then. Um, um, so I'm going to bring a real patient who's experiencing bloodletting in the 21st century, and we're going to work through uh, this major paradigm shift uh, that's underway. So Bastian, why don't you come out and join me? There he is. Hola. So a big theme of all of the future of health is that patients are finally in charge. And so to model that, uh, there's no way I could have been up here to talk to you about the future of health without doing it side by side with a patient, because they're the reason we all have these jobs. Tell us a little bit more about you, Bastian. Thank you for getting me here, Zena. I was diagnosed with diabetes 20 years ago. And yes, I had one of these I can't believe it moments right there. <laughs> for me, the bad stuff in my blood was sugar. And to get it out, I need to inject insulin, right? And in order to know how much insulin I need to get it out or get the blood glucose down, I need to test. And to do that, I need to prick my finger every time. I need to prick my finger and take my blood glucose meter and find out my blood glucose value. I've been doing this on average five times a day for the last 20 years. Now, you can measure diabetes duration in years, and you can measure diabetes in blood glucose readings. As for me, I count days and I count finger pricks. I count the number of finger pricks it takes to get these blood glucose readings. So my almost 20 years of living with diabetes amount to more or less 7,000 days, and that's 35,000 finger pricks in my left middle or ring finger, and that amounts to about 35 liters of blood taking from these two fingers mm -hmm. over the course of uh, the last 20 years, one drop at a time. Now, to be completely honest, I, I don't really mind. You get used to it, right? It's, it's standard procedure. However, I often wonder how little has changed over the last 20 years, because I've been doing this 20 years ago and I still do it today. Another example, I go to see my endocrinologist every three months. I've been doing this for the last 20 years. I might have skipped one or two, but basically I go there every three months. She does another bloodletting exercise on me. She draws an even larger blood sample to test my HbA1c. That's my long-term blood glucose reading. Now she does that every three months. She looks at my blood glucose readings. We talk a little bit. She hands me a prescription for three months worth of insulin and more test strips and then sends me back home. And 12 weeks later, I come back for the exact same procedure. And I really wonder whether this is really necessary. And I think we're going to talk about more about paradigm shifts, because I really wonder whether this is necessary or whether this is just the paradigm of our times regarding diabetes, that a patient with diabetes has to come see his endocrinologist every three months 
no matter what. So let's talk about paradigms. So a paradigm is like a map. If you're trying to get from A to B and the map you have is wrong, um, you're never going to get there. And, you know, we knew about paradigms and uh, we've observed them. Thomas Kuhn has probably written the most about these. And where he observed is where you have the current paradigm, and his context is when we get big shifts in our understanding of science, um, we start to feel like the current paradigm's not working. Things aren't fitting. There's anomalies. And then that's where the shift happens to the new normal, the new science. But it's propelled by revolutionary science. And in that zone of the shift from the old to the new is where there's discontinuity, ambiguity, value shifts from one pool to another pool. That's precisely where we're at on the cusp of uh, in health. But usually there's a little bit of a trigger. So if you think of the big paradigm shift, you think of Copernicus, the Polish a mathematician who was certain from his mathematical models that we had it wrong. The earth was not the center of the universe. It was actually the sun. He couldn't put his name on that publication when he published it. He was tried for treason. They wanted to kill him for suggesting that they would go against what the Christian church had been certain. The earth was at the center. And it wasn't until hundreds of years later with Galileo and others that this became the normal paradigm. Well, that's precisely what's happening in health. The current paradigm we have, the health systems we have, were designed kind of on a post-World War II when we built healthcare, on a system designed around the system, around the doctors, around the hospitals, around the buildings. And these people called the patients were kind of left outside to passively kind of come in and out of that system. And the new paradigm is about the person, not always the patient because health and wellness is now a big focus. And we're just at the cusp of that big exponential shift that Kuhn talked about. And why we're on that cusp are three big forces that were never together at the same time with the same level of, of, uh, of force. So the first is we're kind of out of money, right? So, you know, the demand for services for care because of the growing population, the aging population, and we can actually keep people alive for a really long time with a lot of diseases. Um, is exceeding both the supply of the resources to fund that, but more importantly, the capacity of the system we've designed to deal with that amount of volume and medical complexity. And so, so supply is far uh, uh, below demand. But health systems have been talking about this since the 1970s, that we're out of money. So scarcity is a great time to innovate, but that has never been enough of a motivator to really rethink the whole paradigm. So in comes the second force, the patient, the consumer, the user, whatever word you want to use. Um, if somebody's tweeting, let's start a reading list, because I think Pascal suggested a book earlier. I'm going to add this to your Singularity Germany reading list. Eric Topol, he's a doctor, a cardiologist from Scripps, wrote this seminal book, uh, which is a play on the doctor will see you now, the patient will see you now. It pretty much will explain the whole phenomenon. Um, but then you're seeing patients uprising creating an entire new science called participatory medicine, changing the book of the role of the patient in designing medicine, designing medical education, designing products and services and delivering care. And then movements like Patients Included, which was started by my boss, Lucian Angelin, who's also faculty here at Singularity, um, where there's ticks and guidelines for how to be a Patients Included conference, medical journal, innovation center, whatever it is, and we really try to respect that. So consumers are willing, systems are out of money, and then we get the final piece of the puzzle, which is the topic of this. We actually have tools now to do something about it, and I'm going to focus on digital health tools, and I'll define it. You're going to hear from Andrew Hessel uh, later today, which is going to really get into some tools that are taking biology to new realms in the digital domain, but this is really bringing digitization to healthcare is what I'm talking about. So there's your routine definition, which is bringing, you know, ICT and internet to a very, very analog practice. Um, but I think of digital health a little bit bigger, and this is David Shaywitz. He's a contributor to Forbes, a great writer, which is really about the constraints upon which we design these entire institutions of health and medicine, where time was a constraint, distance, place, labor, and knowledge. And all those constraints are now unlocking. And that's why we have this massive proliferation of opportunity with digital health. But the last thing about digital health, 
To get the paradigm to change, it's a mindset change, right? Remember Copernicus, right? So a big message around this digital health revolution that was just in the press this week, it's actually a way of thinking, right? When you're not constrained, when you're in an abundance mindset, as we heard today, digital health becomes a mindset and a way of thinking. So putting that all together, you know, these are kind of six areas where there's going to be major shifts in how this entire world of health and health care, I think globally it's a five to eight trillion dollar medical enterprise, um, it's going to change how it's designed, how it's delivered, how it's paid for, and the value pools are going to shift to completely new players in that. So the first area of shift is the timing of when we intervene on the services. We designed our system today to wait for something to go wrong. It's not a healthcare system, it's a sick care system. We hear that a lot, right? Wait for the symptom, wait for the cancer tumor to be the size of a football or whatever it is. With the tools we have now, uh, we can not only be preventative, which has been talked about for decades, but we can actually do it. We can be proactive and even predictive. Catch it before we're even close. And so just to show you some examples of that, so this is, you know, U.S. spending in healthcare. It's about two and a half trillion. The green is how much of that is spent on sick care services, all of it. Um, the left is what are the drivers of health? What causes people to be unhealthy? Uh, so if I did a barometer right now of this room, only about 10% of you are unhealthy because of medical care you received, which is where 90% of what we spend. 90% of what causes health is the postal code you were born in, the literacy of you and your family, your poverty, some of your social context, and a little bit of your genetics, a little bit. So there's now finally a shift of the paradigm to focus on these upstream factors so we're not mopping up all the bad stuff uh, at the end. And it's been talked about, but now it's happening. So if you imagine if this was maybe, you know, uh, Bastian, when you started having your symptoms of diabetes, this is kind of your health span when things get really bad at the peak of the curve or you know, you start getting a sore throat and then it's a full cold or whatever it is. Public health, so the people who make you wash your hands and do your vaccinations and that, they try to intervene a little bit early using these kind of mass market tools with very primitive data. Um, traditional medicine comes in when it's way too late, <laughs> when you're fully symptomatic. Um, but all this mountain of data is now available and able to be collected well beyond your medical data about your blood and your weight and, and those kinds of things, your images, your Facebook feed, your patterns on Twitter, your face, your voice, your speed, where you're moving, the air in your environment, all this data, your genomics, is now there's tools to bring that together and create this world of predictalytics. And here's just one example of the National Health Service in the UK working with a startup, you know, to use a wearable to monitor people well before they're ever going to make that doctor visit and actually recommend they come in for the visit if things look bad and then they don't otherwise. So Bastian, hearing all this, what gets you excited about this possibility of moving from reactive to proactive in your world? It does get me excited because in diabetes, and I'll stick to diabetes throughout today and try and break it down, in diabetes, that shift from reactive to proactive is it's already there, at least on the technical side of things. And I'll give you an example. Diabetes management, uh, it's not an exact science, right? And I'm a quite a well-trained diabetic, but I do make mistakes. I make mistakes every day. Be it that I miscalculate the amount of carbs in a food, or I underestimate the effect of physical activity on my body. Now, both events can lead to hypoglycemia, which, if I notice it too late, can be quite dangerous. If I sense it early enough, there are certain precursor signs you notice when you've been living with diabetes. If I sense it early enough, what I do is when I know a hypo is coming, is I take out my blood glucose meter, I test my blood glucose, it tells me, yes, you're going into a hypo or you're already in a hypo. I eat something sweet or I drink something sweet, I wait a while, I'm out of business for 15 minutes and then everything is fine. That's reactive. That's how it has been for me for most part of these 20 years. Today, already, I do wear a sensor. It's sitting right here. You can probably not see it. Mm. That sensor is actually measuring my blood glucose every five minutes. And it's sending that data to my smartphone. And I can look at it anytime and not only see where my blood glucose is at right now in real time, I can also see the trend. And uh, 
you can see the effect of adrenaline about being <laughs> on a stage like that right here. <laughs> so every 15 minutes, every five minutes, it measures uh, my blood glucose, and I can preset alarms. So if I'm going into a hypo, my cell phone, my iPhone, will actually send, set off an alarm and tell me that I am probably going into a hypo, but it will do so 15 minutes ahead of time. So I'm not even going to know any symptoms because I can react proactively. So I will not have any symptoms. I will not go into a hypo. That's proactive versus Terrific. reactive. Diabetes is so far ahead, um, but this is coming to pretty much every other realm of, of medicine. Okay, the next big shift, the big dislocation, is how much we can tailor services. So we have a system that was designed to be one size fits all, which means one size fits nobody, um, to uh, you know, every word that's the opposite of that, individualized, tailored, precise, precision medicine we hear about, which we'll hear more about, and configured. So you know, you know when you sign up for a 5K race and everybody gets the same t-shirt, right? That's one size fits all, that's medicine. Right? And in medicine, though, we do it based on things called a randomly controlled trial, where we make choices about new procedures or technologies based on what worked for the average, which means it actually works for nobody. Um, and so moving from a segment of one to an N of one is a massive shift for a system that was not designed for that. Many ways to stratify or segment how you design and deliver services. The one that's getting very popular right now is stratifying based on your medical risk. We know in an 80-20 principle, about 20% of the population drives 80% of the demand for services, yet everybody right now gets the same treatment no matter what their risk is. 1% drives like 30% of the utilization. So there's a lot of focus on that 1%, whereas the people who are healthy and don't have issues will get you know, a bit of a call center model versus a very high touch. We can stratify based on social risk, teen pregnancy, bad postal code, poor socioeconomic, different services and ways to treat those situations compared to the opposite. The very popular one, which everyone gets excited about in the tech world, is precision medicine. That's really stratifying based on your biology or biological risk. Genomics is very popular, so an example would be, let's say, all of you, everything was equal, same symptoms, got the same diagnosis and the same drug for whatever illness. We fully know, for a lot of you, the drug either doesn't work and is toxic to your body, it works uh, and it's not toxic, uh, uh, it, it, it's toxic and it doesn't work, whatever. Uh, <laughs> Only for some of you, it actually works and doesn't have side effects. And we can now start to tailor prescribing patterns based on genetic profile. And these are some of the companies I'm very excited about. Assurex was a spin out from Cincinnati, Sequoia backed and just got acquired and is on a massive, massive growth trajectory. Um, the other uh, uh, individualization I get excited about isn't about the tech and the science and all the data. It's just meeting people on where their, their values are in terms of how they want to interface with health and care. So these are a couple startups I get excited about. Self-care catalysts, given that most people that demand services don't have one chronic disease, right? Like Bastion has just diabetes, but most have multiple. So all these apps come out for asthma and cardiovascular and diabetes. And if I have all of those, I got to deal with like all these apps. Self-care lets you build your own app depending on what you're trying to track and manage and monitor with your healthcare team. So basically, very easy interface to build your own app. Shift Health grew up in Toronto, uh, where 70% of the people in my city were not born in Canada. So we have every language. Uh, and so delivering services in English doesn't make a lot of sense if you want to keep your population healthy. And so incredible interfaces of literacy, color of skin, language for people to interact with the healthcare system. What would a, an N of one <laughs> feel or look like in your world, Bastian? The one size fits all versus individualized. Let me stick to that bloodletting example and maybe these quarterly doctor visits I was talking about. One of the main reasons I go to see my endocrinologist is to have her check my HbA1c. That's my long-term blood glucose measure. But Today, that can actually be computed off of that CGM data, the continuous glucose monitor that I'm wearing. And because that data is already on my smartphone, and that smartphone is connected to the cloud, 
it is technically no problem for my diabetes team to link up to that cloud, stream that data, look at it, see if everything is all right, and only call me in if I'm not or if something's happening. They can use pattern detection algorithms that are available that they use in the clinic when I go. But they can do this remotely already. So instead of having me come in every quarter, which is this one-size-fits-all big T-shirt, <laughs> they could ask me to come in when it's needed. And if I look back to the last 20 years, I think for the most part of my diabetes career, I could have well done with just a visit a year, maybe. However, there were times where I probably would have been much better if I had a visit a month or even a week. And what I think is we need a lot more flexibility in how to co-create and co-work between patients and doctors like that. If any of you are in the government and that are funding healthcare, you just heard a 75% reduction in demand for healthcare services is possible. Um, okay, the third big shift is the modality through which we deliver services. Right? So we heard from Pascal, healthcare and agriculture, we're the last analog beasts. And wow, is it uh, so resonant in healthcare. So very institution centered. Even your imagery of healthcare as a hospital, right? You physically go to this place because all the knowledge and resources and machinery and equipment had to be concentrated there. And the future is, is anything but. I love this word, digital. Right? The seamless integration of digital and physical. Physical will never go away from healthcare. It can't. But it's got to be seamlessly integrated. So, uh, you know, a system that was designed on these analog things, bricks, people, pens, paper, and the incredible fax machine, uh, I think we're the only industry using the fax machine, uh, and the pager, well, us and drug dealers, we're the only two industries still using the pager. Um, um, you know, it's, it's so ripe for a different way. And so we heard today about, you know, Peter Diamantes' six Ds. These are my five Ds of the kind of what's happening with the modality of care. Decentralized, dephysicalized, dematerialized, disintermediated, and of course, digital. So here's a slide that Kaiser Permanente, which is one of the top healthcare systems performing in the world out of California, now they can show all these modalities through which you as a member can receive services based on what makes sense for you. And there kind of used to be this line of the digital divide, but I don't think so. It's just kind of digital, right? And their app has got some of the most best downloads, and it just shocks me that, you know, with, if you're a Kaiser member, you can make your appointment online, do a virtual consult, order your drugs online, you don't need to physically go in, and many, many more. They have an over 50% elimination of physical consults. Most healthcare systems in the world are at about 3% virtual. Right? Look at that value pool sitting right there. Um, then you see CB Insights, who does these incredible graphics of all the startups. This is just the unbundling of the hospital, right? Just a sample of little tiny businesses that are biting away at parts of the business model of these legacy incumbents who had the whole value chain and making pretty good businesses out of it. So there goes the hospital, which is why you'll see headlines like this every week in every newspaper saying the death of the hospital, right? Or no more hospital, homespital, I don't agree. It's phone spittle and phones will go away anyway. But the idea of hospital to home or hospital to phone is where systems are heading. So what does it feel like for you if, if we modernize our modalities, Bastian? I wonder what that last slide feels like to my endocrinologist, because yeah. de-physicalization probably seems pretty scary to her. Yep. But don't get me wrong. I don't want to get rid of my diabetes team. On the contrary, I actually do need them, and I do need them quite regularly. I do need them for feedback. I do need them for advice. I need them to talk things through. I sometimes need them for a kick of motivation and sometimes just kick in the ass to <laughs> stay motivated to, to self-manage. However, none of that really requires a physical presence. It doesn't need me to spend half an hour driving to the clinic, sitting in the waiting room for half an hour, spending 15 minutes in the lab, going back up, waiting to be called in and driving home. And I'm lucky I live in Berlin. When I was living up north in my small hometown, it was a lot more. It could basically be a phone call of 15 minutes or maybe a Skype call with a split screen where I can share my data. So I think de-physicalization would just save time and money. Great. All right, next is the duration. So because of the one-size-fits-all and the constraints of time and space, we've, only, we've designed care to be the unit of analysis, the visit between the doctor and the patient, 
that can only happen at these very small bursts of time and very uh, siloed, right? So if you have multiple illnesses, you've got to go to all these different specialists because we designed our health system on diseases and body parts, right? We built all our specialties on parts of the body because that's all we knew at the time. We would have never done it that way. So if you imagine um, a person with a chronic illness, a long-term condition, if you take out the hours they're supposed to be sleeping, they've got about 5,800 hours a year to manage their illness. Six to 10 hours of that is in the formal medical system, these 30-minute visits that they might get every so-and-so. And if you unpack that 30-minute visit, uh, you know, a lot of it is waiting, a lot of waiting. And then even in that time of 11 minutes is the average of a typical visit with a doctor, about four or five minutes is a communication of massive information between these two players, right? Extremely inefficient and constrained way to deal with people's health. And so all of that activity kind of across your lifetime will generate for the average adult about three and a half gigs of data, largely on paper. Even though we have medical records, it's still uh, in analog. Yet we know, and this was a great slide from Exponential Med a couple years ago, at this point in time, the human avatar, all the data you can get about your biology and your body is about 150 gigs, and the bulk of it is not going to come out of formal medicine. Right? So this big kind of tension. So lots of tools now basically replacing the doctor or a diagnostic center, you know, and putting it into your, into your phone. And these ones are really mucky. <laughs> they're, they're very old and archaic. We'll laugh at them a year from now. But pretty much everything can be democratized which is really opening up opportunity in highly resource constrained environments that never had the luxury of training medical school, having medical schools and doctors and hospitals. They're just leapfrogging all that. So what does continuous and, and uh, you know, not so siloed look like for you? Well, I like that first slide. You know, diabetes really is a 24-7 disease, and so are many other chronic diseases. And as you were showing, 99% of the time, I'm left with this all alone. And quarterly visits, really, they really miss the point. So what I'd like to see instead is something like a 1-800-diabetes number I can call whenever I have the feeling that I need support. And for such a service to operate, I would like to see electronic health records where my data is stored so I can share it with whoever is on the other end of the line. It doesn't need to be the same end every time. This is also true for what you were saying about the, the silos. Uh, I actually do have one comorbidity, I do have to see another doctor, which is a neurologist, because I suffer from epilepsy-style seizures sometimes. This goes back a long while ago when I had very severe hypoglycemia that I didn't sense. So when I go there, guess what she does? Another bloodletting. She <laughs> takes another blood sample to do the exact same measurements. She just looks at other data than my endocrinologist. Now, I tried to have them exchange the data. I actually took photocopies of the blood sample that was taken a week before at my endo and brought it to my neurologist. She prefers to have her own data. Of course. <laughs> so my boss, Lucien Angelin, has a pretty provocative statement that we won't be that far away from, you can subscribe to Apple for 99 cents a month and they'll manage all of your health care, everything you yeah. need, right? Because it'll be that democratized. Fifth shift is the power shift. Oh boy, the power in healthcare. The power used to be with the person with all the knowledge and all the training. The power now is the data, and the data is mine. And so people-powered health is the new language, the new term. Um, so there's this kind of ladder of ways patients can be involved in their own care. We've kind of started by doing everything to the patient. They're this passive, dumb recipient of this expert knowledge starting to get some voice and some influence like what you're doing kind of on the policy side, so doing things for the patient. And now what's emerging will be the full paradigm is with or by uh, the patient, where they're the real leader and partner. And so you th see things like this emergence where you know, your provider had all the knowledge and the skills and they gave it to you whenever they thought it was appropriate. We're now kind of starting to do a little bit of two-way. You bring some of your data perhaps to your provider and they may be interested but we're moving to a, you know, a fully democratized network where the network will have all the information you need when you need it, and your clinician will actually ask you to subscribe to your data, to your avatar, and you can monetize your avatar if you really want to as a patient. And so this is one of my favorite quotes from Eric Topol from The Patient Will See You Now. 
uh, about the value and the power of this democratized network of information instead of one clinician or a couple and whatever they happen to have in their brain. So what does this power shift feel like for you, Bastian? Well, I think being responsible for your own health or being the CEO of your own health can actually feel quite scary for some. And they might actually prefer to delegate some of that responsibility back to the doctors, and that's okay. As for me with diabetes, I like to have a say. I would like to know what's happening. I want to have the information and about the treatment that I get and why I get it. And I actually like the idea of co-creating my therapy together with my doctor. What I like even more is crowdsourcing for that information instead of just asking one doctor that I'm seeing face to face. So I like to crowdsource this information in the diabetes community out there. And in a way, this 1-800-diabetes number that I was talking about, it already exists. But it doesn't exist within formal healthcare. It exists out there on social media in what we call the DOC, the Diabetes Online Community. So it's in Facebook groups and diabetes blogs and tweets out there that I can look at and talk to people behind them. Um, and that's, that's much more reliable than Dr. Google. So what I think is this, this kind of peer-to-peer -peer support networks and patient voice just needs to get a little bit more credit. All right, and the last shift. You know, with everything above, then the business models upon which our legacy systems, whether they're our government, our insurers, our pharma companies, our medical education facilities were built, uh, was a currency and a business model on, you know, inputs, cost, volume, right? How many pills, how many visits we pay by the, on a fee for service to the ability to now design business models that actually are based on value. This is called value-based healthcare. Michael Porter, the Harvard scholar, one of the top business scholars, really created a language and a framework that I'm seeing pretty much every health system, every company embracing as their lens for how to design their business model, which is we're not going to you know, treat healthcare as a cost center anymore. It's a value center, and therefore, outcomes are just as important to measure as the costs we're putting in. And so you'll see uh, places like Karolinska in Sweden has just blown up their entire business model, and the, you know, the most guilty of business model malpractice in healthcare are hospitals. Um, so the courage to blow that up and move to a fully value-based model where they literally will take themes of issues of parents and bundle the payment across whoever might need to help, emergency, labs, surgery, whatever it is, instead of paying every unit of the value chain their piece. Uh, this is gonna infect industry like crazy, so the leaders like Medtronic, Novartis and others are realizing the gig is up. They're not going to get paid anymore for their unit or their pill, even though it only works 30% of the time. They'll only get paid when it works. What does a value-based paradigm mean, mean for your world? Well, if we put our money where our mouth is, it means that we should invest where we see value creation for the patient. Unfortunately, most of what we're seeing now is we see that money follows return on investment. And unfortunately, in healthcare, those two are rarely the same. Just an example, look at the current hype around diabetes apps. If you go to the app store, there's thousands of diabetes apps out there. Everybody seems to be doing a diabetes app right now. And some of them claim to have millions of users. <laughs> now, I question that because in order to really make a difference and create value for the patient, a diabetes app has to be used several times a day, every day, for a continued period of time. Otherwise, in diabetes, it doesn't make sense. So downloads don't equal value for the patient. It's complete nonsense. Non-active user accounts in an app don't, don't create value. If we invest in what works, we have to invade in, invest in integrated care models where technology might be a big driver. We should invest in community support, in local models. It's much about local, uh, local networks. And uh, the thing is that apart from government funding, we don't see a lot of funding going that way. Yep. All right, so lots of change coming, exciting change. Um, uh, it did take generations for these paradigms, bloodletting, the earth being flat, to happen. I'm pretty confident after uh, Pascal's intro today, it's not going to take generations for these shifts. That's what the exponentials do, coupled to the consumer pull, coupled to a system that's out of money. That's like the perfect storm we're in. Um, but lots of barriers between getting from the system we have 
and the system we want that we know is coming. Um, and so we get to, I'm just going to skip through these, what can you do about it, right? So we've got three calls to action as we wrap up. Um, you as a citizen and a taxpayer, so you should know 10 to 15 percent, more like 18 percent of the U.S., of your GDP, of your taxes, pays for health care. Um, as a business person, a startup, a company owner, a hospital person, a, a doctor, and then as a patient. Um, so I'll just quickly give you my three and then I'll ask you to, to wrap up. We're just kind of, they're cutting us off on the time. Yeah. So as a citizen, I, my only plea to you is demand more. Ask for transparency. Ask what the value you're getting for these dollars you're spending. Um, ask for the data to be liberated because it belongs to you, to the citizen, not to the people who generated it. As a business, you should be really scared <laughs> about uh, your business model. And the name of the game is creative destruction of your own business model. Not easy to do, um, but that's the only way to survive because these new players are ready to bite away at everything you have. It's not a surprise that uh, Apple, Google, Samsung, Philips, Qualcomm, you name them, health is their number one priority. And they understand customers. Um, and then as a patient, uh, if you're not one already, you're going to be. You're going to experience the pains we talked about, and it's going to enrage you, and there's lots you can do to step up uh, and activate that. So some final thoughts on, on these calls to action for, for the audience from your perspective. Yeah. I think from a citizen perspective here in Germany, it's pretty simple. There's, as a citizen with diabetes, there's 7 million people with diabetes in Germany. 2017 is election year. What more can I say? 10% of our health expenditure, 35 billion a year, is going into diabetes care. From the business perspective, deconstruction, you call it, I think every endocrinologist, which is a business as well, should start thinking about deconstructing their business model of having me come in every three months. That would have effects on reimbursement, insurance companies. That would have effects on pharma. Pharma will have to lose its focus. Medtech will have to lose its focus on products and go to delivering meaningful digital services. And there are companies that are doing that already. The only thing that scares me is that it's mostly companies like Apple, Facebook, Google investing in this space. They are the ones who invest most in digital health, and it's not the traditional players. And I kind of fear that maybe they should partner to not have a gap of knowledge and uh, experience. Now, from the patient perspective, last thing, maybe diabetes doesn't concern you, right? And I apologize for having talked about diabetes all the time, but diabetes is just a brilliant case study because it is very well researched. It is very much reliant on data and digitalization, and uh, so the opportunities that are derived from that can make a, a, a big role. So. Even if it doesn't concern you, chronic disease will, as you were saying, sometime down the road. As a patient, as a family member, as a friend, it will concern you. And integrated approaches to diabetes, and especially to diabetes prevention, don't really have that much to do only with diabetes. If you're preventing diabetes, you're also talking preventing heart disease, stroke, asthma, many other things. So whenever you hear me talk diabetes, basically just think of it as healthy living. And so with that, so next time Stefan or others invite me to come speak about digital health, I'm going to hope that's going to exponentially go away. We shouldn't be using this word. It's just health. It's health in a digital world. You don't talk about going to do your digital banking or your digital travel planning or your digital uh, communication with your team. It's just how you work in a digital world. And, and health is just around the corner. And you guys can all be part of it. I want to thank Bastian for coming here, his courage for sharing his story. Thank you. <laughs> and then, I don't know, a couple of questions? There's not like a thing pulling us off the stage right now. <laughs> Thoughts? Yep, right here in the middle. You guys need one of those boxes, the microphones that you throw around the room? Thank you guys, you're doing a really great job. I'm a big believer in the future of uh, personalized medicine. And uh, I just want to hear your opinion about the data privacy. You know, there were a lot of discussions about yeah. like patients like me or stuff like this, right? Where we're talking about, okay, I'm sharing my data, they're becoming public, so maybe Bison also can come back on this. How do you feel about it, right? And would you, as a patient, 
be willing to share as many as possible, uh, as much as possible to have uh, better feedback or maybe better healthcare? I get asked that question quite a lot. And I mean, I am sharing data already, right? This is my blood glucose values. They're going up into the cloud. I'm sharing it right now live with my girlfriend back home. She's <laughs> kind of watching over me. And of course, anybody could hack into this and see my data. Do I care? Do I like that? No, not really. But you know what? If you come up, and this is something that is very typical in Germany, if you come up with this data protection is everything argument, you just never have innovation. You're just never going to go anywhere. So for me as a patient, to be honest, I, I love to have this in my pocket. And I want more of this. I want more innovation. I want more solutions. I want more digital because it helps me every day. And of course, I want very strict laws on data protection that make sure that nothing goes wrong. But don't overdo it because we need innovation first because it helps me. I think privacy is a myth. People use it as a reason not to innovate in healthcare. Yeah, that's the short version. <laughs> Hi. Um, you showed impressively that uh, digital health is a solution in, let me, let me say, um, relatively simple diseases. So in diabetes, type 1 diabetes, you have one parameter, which is glu blood glucose. You have one therapy, which is insulin, which is available, basically. Uh, and uh, digital health helps to better distribute the resources and help you manage the disease better. How does that tie into more complex diseases like cancer, for example, where you have 10,000s of potential mutations that are causing the disease in each individual patient, and uh, where we don't even have the tip of the iceberg of the repertoire of ter targeted therapies we need uh, to treat, and every single one of them costs two billion on average to develop and 15 years to develop. So who's going yeah. to pay for it? Yeah, so I think we're not gonna get in a big cancer who's gonna pay, but only to say Andy Hessel will, I think, hit on that quite a bit. The science is on an exponential curve. The idea that we made drugs from a 20 year, $2 billion process and tested them in humans in these things called clinical trials, that will be in the bloodletting story in a couple years from our kids. So it's moving at a fast pace. There's incredible results. Uh, the FDA approved, I think, 36 digital technologies as FDA approved medical devices. The science is getting there. So I feel really confident. I'm happy to have an offline conversation about that. It is not for the simple, simple <laughs> diseases. Actually, most of the value will come from complex illness, which drives 85% of the demand for healthcare services. Right? That's where the focus is. And if I may add one thing, if you think diabetes is really a simple disease, <laughs> uh, I invite you to wear the sensor just for a day and see what happens even to a healthy body. It's not that easy. Okay, next year, Pascal, <laughs> everyone wears a sensor during the talk. We aggregate the data. Okay. Any last questions? In the corner, yeah, people at the back have been very quiet. Okay, there, then there, and then we'll wrap up. Sana, thanks really? very much for your great presentation. And Bastian, thanks for sharing your story. Um, I worked with patients in uh, markets that don't have access to the care that you benefit from here. It's many low-income markets. Um, and you may know very well that um, chronic diseases are on the rise in these markets as well, or in these countries, regions, however you may call them. And I wanted to ask the two of you, how do you see technology improve access to care where we, people really don't have the care that we benefit from here? Thank you. Yeah, again, I, they're actually able to leapfrog, right? The mobile tools are uh, the doctor and the phone is allowing you know, a good 80% of what's uh, currently done in our formal care to be done without formal medicine. So it's actually opening up access at a very democratized rate than our very physical infrastructure. And you're starting to see entire uh, programs and institutes built up to do frugal innovation or reverse innovation. So let's go to Kenya, see how they figure out glaucoma care in a very, very resource-constrained environment and bring that back into the West so we can be triggered with innovation. So I think it's actually a huge opportunity, which is why Medtronic and, Fa and Pfizer and all the others have an entire business unit just for those markets, uh, because it's a different business model. Okay, and uh, sorry, Bastian, anything to add? 
Thank you so much for walking the talk and having a patient on stage with you. Thank you for this talk. Um, I was wondering, uh, from your experience, um, what are the trends in um, creating digital literacy within the hospitals for doctors, for nurses? Um, we've all been there that you have all these people that have been trained uh, in a certain way now having to deal with computer systems that are not always human-centered and very hard to use. Um, especially in Germany, I think that's a very big problem. Yeah. Um, do you have any good examples on, on training people, um, nurses, doctors, and raising this digital literacy for yeah, I mean, there's pockets all over, so two things to know, and then I'd love to get your thoughts, and you can have then the last word as the patient, which is how it should be. Um, the medical students who finished their residency, I think three years ago, were the first ever digital natives to graduate out of medicine, which means they were born into an era where computers were everywhere. So I think we're kind of okay for the next generation, and then the patients who are now showing up, who live in the 21st century for the rest of their life, show up in this analog healthcare, and they're like, WTF? Like, what is this? So, so I think that's gonna clean up. So you just have this weird zone of one generation of patients and clinical providers, and they stay around a long time. Um, and so is it worth it to go rewire? I don't know. But a place like Radbad, where I work, we help redesign the medical curriculum every six months to include e-health, digital health. I contrast that with University of Toronto. I'm, I work in the Faculty of Medicine. They haven't touched the curriculum in 50 years. And to change the curriculum for doctors is like a committee that has a committee to make a task force to make a report. And then four years later, you know, we change one lecture. So, so different, different health systems are at different paces of progressive and it, it's, it needs a good leader. What's your thoughts? What, how savvy are your care providers? Well, I think you're very right on the point that especially in Germany, probably in other countries as well, but especially in Germany, digital literacy in health is, uh, is pretty low. When we started DDoc, which is our community ecosystem for patient voice, uh, it felt like running into two meter thick concrete walls. <laughs> when we introduced the idea of patients helping each other via social media and Facebook and Twitter, everybody was freaking out. You can't do that. This has only been five years ago. Now, digital literacy, what's happening today is we use DDoc and that community and that hub, that ecosystem for patient voice and exchange this 1-800-diabetes number to help each other. And there's many, many, many people with diabetes connecting to it. What happens is when I go to see my endocrinologist, when it gets to digital solutions, she asks me. And I am the one who probably knows a lot more about what's out there in terms of new apps or new digital services. And we are getting into a sort of conversation that goes the other way around. And I think that's a very interesting development. And I think we will see more of that to come, not because we, need, we do need better training and better universities that teach upcoming med students to f find out a different way of thinking about health and including digital. But even with the generation we have now, I think it's coming and it's going to come from the patient yep. no matter what. Perfect ending. Thank you very much.